Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison. In the spirit of the trees, in the spirit of a living nature of which we are a part, I want to welcome you to this session of Humanity Rising. And as we uh, get going uh, today, I want to just bring in our good friend and supporter, Stan Pokras, uh, who's having retinal surgery today, so he won't be with us. Uh, and I just want us to just remember Stan. He's done so much uh, to support Humanity Rising. He has uh, cataloged every single session. Uh, he's identified every single speaker we've ever had. He has uh, archived things and done an extraordinary uh, uh, job of uh, detailing every single one of our 478 sessions as of today. Uh, so I just want us all to remember Stan and send healing vibes and warm thoughts and much love uh, as he undergoes surgery um, uh, for one of his eyes. Uh, so uh, it's in that spirit, I'd like to invite all of us to just take a moment to just pause uh, and be in our bodies. We all have eyes, we all have things that go wrong and need repair. And let us uh, center ourselves on our hearts for just a moment in a spirit of gratitude and thanksgiving that we're alive at this very precious and fragile moment in the human journey. Thank you, everyone. Today, we want to turn our attention to a matter that I think many of you will find a little touchy uh, and controversial, uh, because what we're going to discuss today will be uh, at odds with what many of you believe to be true uh, about the situation uh, in Ukraine. Uh, I have deep concerns about what's going on in, in my opinion and the opinion of many other people who watch these matters closely over time as historians. Uh, we are in a more dangerous period now with regards to possible nuclear exchanges than at any time since the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962 which is the closest the world has ever come to a nuclear exchange. And we're gonna talk about that uh, with a, a very distinguished uh, gentleman in, in a few minutes. Uh, but before we uh, get to uh, introducing our uh, speaker today, I want to provide a context uh, for what's happening in Ukraine. 
And as I said, I know it's going to challenge what many of you uh, believe uh, to be true, uh, but nevertheless, I feel constrained, uh, both as a historian, but also as someone who spent a lot of time in Eastern Europe, and in particularly in Russia uh, over the years. Uh, so that I have a very uh, specific knowledge based on experience. And I want to share a little bit of that as we begin our program today, uh, because I, I, I think it's just historically and contemporarily urgent that we all understand the truth beyond the propaganda that is being fed to us 24-7 um, through the major uh, news media. First, let me just give you some of my background so you have a sense of who I am as I'm speaking to you about these matters. I've been traveling uh, to uh, the Soviet Union since October of 1982. And I developed a great fondness and friendship for the people of Eastern Europe and the people of uh, the Soviet Union from that time. And I worked tirelessly with many colleagues from Europe, United States, and what was then the Soviet Union and what they called citizen diplomacy. Ensuring that as the two countries under Reagan uh, and um, then uh, Bush and subsequent presidents, presidents generated the tensions of the Cold War. There were hundreds or thousands of us citizen diplomats that were trying to bring understanding to the truth of the matter about what was really happening. Uh, at one point, I had a, an apartment in Moscow. I would imagine I've traveled back and forth to uh, that part of the world um, 70, 75, 80 times. I uh, uh, had uh, a particular specialty while I was uh, working in Soviet American relations. Many of my uh, colleagues were into citizen diplomacy and brought citizen exchanges and just ordinary citizens back and forth to increase understanding. I had a different interest. Uh, I had uh, studied uh, Russian and Soviet history while I was in college. I uh, majored actually in totalitarian systems. That was a fascination for me. So when I um, started to go to the Soviet Union, I directed my attention to the Central Committee and the Politburo, the ruling elite of the Soviet Union. And I was uh, very fortunate, made very good relationships with uh, many of the people uh, on the Central Committee and the Politburo. And I was meeting with people uh, that people in the U.S. Embassy under Ambassador Hartman at the time, uh, were not even able to meet. And I was hanging out at their dachas and, and at one point bringing them over to the United States and engaging uh, in what we call hot tub diplomacy at the Esalen Institute, many stories that I could tell. I ended up uh, developing a personal relationship with um, uh, Alexander Yakovlev, who was the head of ideology of the Politburo. Uh, that was important because it was Yakovlev that brought into the Politburo Mikhail Gorbachev and Edward Shevardnadze. Uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, as you know, uh, became the president of the Soviet Union after the death of uh, Leonid Brezhnev and then uh, Chernenko and then Andropov. And then Gorbachev was brought in and it was all orchestrated by Yakovlev. And he also orchestrated Shevardnadze to become the foreign minister under uh, Gorbachev. And I got to know both these gentlemen, uh, Shevardnadze and Gorbachev. I also got to know Boris Yeltsin. I was the one who organized Boris Yeltsin's trip to the United States in September of 1989, during which he had that epiphanal experience uh, in uh, Houston, Texas, uh, as we were leaving uh, the Houston Space Center. Uh, where he went into a, uh, uh, a supermarket. He wanted to stop into a supermarket. And uh, he saw all the goods that 
uh, were available to Americans. And it was that experience, as he recounts in his own autobiography, uh, written while he was president, uh, that turned him to understand that the communist regime in the Soviet Union was bankrupt. They'd been lying to the Russian people, Soviet people, and that he dedicated himself to overthrowing that regime. I saw it happen right in front of my eyes. Uh, in uh, December of uh, 1990, when uh, Edward Shevardnadze resigned as foreign minister, I was the one who uh, tracked him down and brought him to the United States uh, in uh, April of 1991 to explain to the American people. We went to the White House and we were at the Council on Foreign Relations to explain to the American people what happened. Why did this foreign minister resign? Um, and then I worked with Shevard Natsa and, and uh, uh, former Secretary of State by then George Schultz and Secretary of State Jim Baker to mobilize what we called the Russian Winter Campaign uh, as the Soviet Union was beginning to fall apart because of the machinations of Yeltsin, uh, who was maneuvering the overthrow of Gorbachev and the way he figured out to do it was basically to uh, break the Soviet Union apart. I was at his kitchen table while he was talking about it in Moscow. And then as the uh, fate would have it, I ended up uh, uh, getting to know uh, Mr. Gorbachev and I was the last foreigner to be received by Gorbachev in his office in the Kremlin. And I was one of the first people to know that he was gonna resign. Yakovlev told me. And uh, so I was an intimate, I would say, to the Soviet elite as the Soviet Union was falling apart. And all during this time, I was studying Russian history and Soviet affairs and Soviet uh, Chinese affairs and American history and so forth and so on. So I will lay out for a few minutes the history between that period of 1990, 1991 till in February of this year when Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine, because unless we understand what happened, we won't understand what's happened with the invasion. You all remember the fall of the Berlin Wall. One of the tacit agreements that was in place during that time, and the reason why Gorbachev let it happen, it was not only because of the foment of the people, but he'd had discussions with President George Bush and Secretary of State Baker saying that if the Soviet Union had allowed, uh, uh, was to allow Eastern Europe and East Germany to uh, take a different route and withdraw Soviet troops, that the United States would not push NATO to the east. This was the fundamental agreement between the Soviet leader and the Americans, that the World Warsaw Treaty Organization would go away, the Soviets would let Eastern Europe move in a different direction, and in exchange for that, the United States would not push NATO to the east. That agreement was never written down, but I was around and I talked to all these people, and I know for a fact that that was the understanding. In fact, Gorbachev said that the security of one is the security of all. It was Gorbachev who first proposed that uh, the, the whole notion of the Warsaw Treaty Organization and NATO was sort of an absurdity in the modern world with nuclear weapons. And then of course, Yeltsin's machinations collapsed the Soviet Union 
And Yeltsin made the same statement. We're no longer communist. We're no longer your enemy. Why doesn't Russia join the EU, join NATO, and let's create a common security zone? <clears throat> and then Vladimir Putin, when he succeeded uh, Yeltsin, made the same request. And this was now by, by this time was under President Clinton. And uh, Putin uh, came in uh, to uh, the presidency in 2000. In 1999, it was President Bill Clinton that made the first moves under the impulse of the neoconservatives in the US government that saw there was a golden opportunity for the United States instead of designing a world for peace to design instead what they called full spectrum dominance of the United States taking advantage of a unipolar moment to maintain dominance rather than peace. So it was in 1999 that President Clinton upended the tacit agreement between Gorbachev and Bush and began the eastward expansion of NATO with Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic. So that's why with Putin coming into power in 2000, saying to Clinton, don't do that. Russia should join the EU, should join NATO. That, was, that has been what the Russian leaders have been saying since the fall of the Soviet Union. They're no longer communist. They should be welcomed in to a common security zone. That's what Gorbachev said originally. And yet, 2004, NATO expanded again and brought in the Baltic states of Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia, Croatia, Slovakia. And then in 2008, in Bucharest, there was a Bucharest conference in Romania, which had also become part of NATO. The United States, over the objections of Germany and France, insisted that they officially declare that NATO was now going to expand to Ukraine and to Poland, excuse me, and to Georgia. And in the fall of uh, that year, Russia went into Georgia, just like they're going into Ukraine now, not to take over Georgia, but to establish a military um, reality to preclude Georgia from ever joining NATO. And it was at that point again that Foreign Minister Lavrov, Vladimir Putin stated unequivocally that if Ukraine was to join NATO at the insistence of the United States, that was an existential threat. That was the red line beyond which Russia would react. In 2014, there was a coup in the Ukraine and the United States and the Central Intelligence Agency uh, 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 overthrew um, the pro-Putin uh, leader of Russia and brought in someone that was pro-Western. And that began the foment in the Ukraine around Ukraine joining NATO and the EU. As late as last uh, November and December, <clears throat> Putin, Zelensky uh, 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 and uh, the Germans actually into this year were trying to negotiate an agreement whereby NATO would not move into the Ukraine. Ukraine would declare its neutrality. And again, Putin offered as late as late last year that listen, NATO has no enemy here with Russia. Russia should actually join NATO. 
join the EU, and he was rebuffed. And Zelensky broke off those negotiations. So by February of this year, that's when the incursions into Ukraine took place. There was a lot of brouhaha in the press that Putin was going to invade Ukraine and go into Eastern Europe because he believes in a greater mother Russia and so forth. But as you see, after two months of war, the Russians have just taken a little bit. They weren't invading Ukraine. They were doing in Ukraine in 2022 what they did in Georgia in 2008. They're making sure, as John Mersheimer said, they're going to wreck Ukraine. If Ukraine isn't smart enough to do the obvious and allow us to have a buffer zone, um, they're going to take the military action as minimalistically as they can, but to ensure that the United States in particular, which is driving this, ceases from this pursuit. So I wanted to lay this out as we begin our discussions with Ray McGovern, who is a former CIA agent. During the Reagan administration, it was John, uh, Ray's uh, uh, task to provide the daily briefings, the CIA briefings to uh, President Reagan's uh, national security staff. Uh, and he did this for a number of years. He's fluent in Russian. He's fluent in German. Uh, he has been tracking these matters, also the, the, uh, the Chinese uh, theater uh, as well, and he knows a lot. And the reason why Ray is very important for us to listen to today is was Ray McGovern, who saw what was happening during the, the Bush Jr. administration in terms of the precursor to the invasion of Iraq. Remember the weapons of mass destructions? That was all a fabrication. And it was Ray McGovern that began to organize intelligence agents, former intelligence agents in particular, who knew what the truth was to speak truth to power. And we're now in that same situation where the public is being manipulated by lies and propaganda, I have no other way to put it, and is speaking out along with many other people who actually know the history. John, uh, Jack Matlock is one who's a historian. He was the last um, uh, ambassador uh, of the United States to um, the Soviet Union. Uh, uh, before it collapsed in 1991. He's been speaking out. A number of people have been speaking out. So what I just shared with you is not just Jim Garrison's opinion. It's the history of what happened as actual fact, which is being completely ignored um, as uh, we are being um, uh, told that this was an unprovoked invasion and we've got to stop Putin, we've got to bolster NATO, and we've got to bring Ukraine into NATO and the, the EU to protect the, the, uh, uh, the uh, 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 Eastern Front of free Europe. Nothing could be further from the truth. And so I feel a lot fairly passionate about this, as you all know, um, because I happen to know what the the actual truth of the matter uh, is, and I can see day in and day out the kind of, of, uh, <clears throat> of, of uh, mismessaging and falsehoods, just like the U.S. government did in the run-up and during the Iraq war and the Iraq invasion. Uh, so, Ray McGovern, I'd like to welcome you. Ray, uh, he's been on our program before. Uh, he's a very articulate, very wise man. And so, Ray, I want to welcome you. And I'd like to, first of all, uh, open up if you want to make any comment on what I said, if there's any places that you feel I didn't get it quite right, or you want to add detail. Why don't we start from there so we get 
your sense of of the context, I would say, for uh, the um, the Russian uh, incursion uh, into Ukraine, and then we'll go from there. But thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Jim. Um, Jim, I'm a little older than you, and uh, actually, I've been watching Russia and Soviet Union for about as long as you have, maybe even longer. I'd like to just uh, add a historical note here about sure. what the Russian peoples have have experienced. You know, they don't really have a history until the ninth century, when a couple of Greek priests constructed an alphabet for them. <laughs> they had a very rich oral tradition. They had epics like the Odyssey and the Iliad, but they had no way to write them down. So long story short, it wasn't until the ninth century that they had a written alphabet. So we compare that with other civilizations. You can see that there's kind of a playing catch up from the start. Next thing to know is that for two centuries, uh, when Western Europe was coming out of the dark ages, Russia was invaded and ruled by what they call the Tatarskaya Iga, the Tartar yoke, the Mongols, Genghis Khan, and the rest of them. They didn't get out from under that until about the 13th century. And then what did they experience? <laughs> the Poles, the Lithuanians, the Hanseatic League. Um, who else? Um, well, the people up in that part of Europe, uh, uh, tried to well did invade and did try to um, maneuver things so that so that Ivan Grozny, Ivan the Terrible, would not be able to get the act together and get these uh, those those Russian boyars together and cause a, uh, a central government. So what we what, the reason I raise that now is because you know when the, the Russian people get educated they know these things. They know not only about Lithuania and Poland and the Hanseatic League, they also know about Napoleon. They also know about Hitler. And they know exactly where these guys came through and the country happens to be called Ukraine these days. Now, Peter the Great in around 1700, people don't know this, but he was a really enterprising young man. And so he spent two years on the wharves of Petersburg, trying to figure out whether the Western world was better than what he was used to in Russia. He came back you mean and Rotterdam. He said, Rotterdam. It was Rotterdam. Yeah. Well, yeah. thanks very much. Yeah. Um, so uh, he learned a lot about the, uh, the Russian, the, the Western world. And decided, well, uh, you know, let's prorobit akno, uh, beat a window into Western Europe. Now, I'm going to recite just a little bit of a poem from Alexander Pushkin, the famous Russian poet, who talked about Peter the Great and what he tried to do. Atnyud grazit, grazit, Ivan Grozny, Ivan the Terrible, atnyud grazit, mi budim shvedu. From here, Petersburg. We're going to grazit, terribly threaten, Shvedu, Sweden. Today, we're going to have a, by nature, we're preordained to have this new, this new benchmark here, this new bulwark, from where into Europe, we're going to smash a window. And that's pretty much what the Russians have been trying to do since 1700 and not been accepted. One of the biggest insults they feel is when people say you scratch a Russian and you get a Tartar. OK, so they're not been accepted. And this is nothing new. If we have Sweden, Finland, uh, Poland threatening Russia, people know this in Russia, not to mention the, the trials and tribulations from Napoleon and Hitler. So that's, that's the stage. Now, when, as, as Jim pointed out, uh, the US promised not to move NATO one inch, and that was an explicit promise, one inch toward Moscow or to Russia, um, if 
Gorbachev and Shevardnadze accepted the idea of a reunited Germany. <laughs> My God, think about it. These guys were around when Russia lost 26 million people during World War II, okay? U.S. casualties, 420,000 plus all military, all soldiers. So here they're being offered a deal by James Baker. And Baker was, of course, Secretary of State for George H.W. Bush. He says, here, how about this? I would like to have a reunited Germany. <laughs> My impression of what Gorbachev and Chevrolet did at that point was that pretty, it was what I did. You know, I grew up, I was, I was alive during World War II. Maybe I saw too many World War II movies, but I didn't want a reunited Germany. I mean, and I didn't belong to a country that had lost 26 million, okay? But the whole purpose of NATO was to keep the U.S. in, keep Russia out, and to keep Germany divided, <laughs> okay? So th this is a big quid that Jim, James Baker is being asked. Uh, so, I mean, that he's asking. So uh, government trust said, we need to sleep on this. Came back the next day and said, you promise. You promise not one inch. NATO will not move one inch eastward from the borders of East Germany. Cross your heart, hope to die. <laughs> James Baker said, of course. Now, James Baker is a slick Texas lawyer. He's still alive, okay? Uh, he, he knew that this should be written down. Oil, all lawyers know this should be written down. But for, for some reason, it wasn't written down. But it's clear as a bell from the notes of people like uh, James Baker himself and Shevard Nadze and Helmut Kohl in, in Germany at the time. So that was the start of, of, this, uh, of this real problem. Fast forward to 2008. I'll just fill in a couple of, uh, of blanks there that, uh, that Jim uh, hurried through. The 1st of February, 2008. Okay, Putin's in charge. A new foreign secretary, Sergei Lavrov, is the foreign minister. So he calls Bill Burns, our ambassador in Moscow. He happens to be CIA director now. He calls him in and says, Mr. Burns, do you know what NET means? <laughs> Burns said, oh, yeah. It's well, NET means NET. Ukraine? Georgia membership in NATO is our red line. Now, how do I know that? WikiLeaks divulged the Moscow cable that, that uh, Bill Burns wrote. Uh, if I've seen one Moscow cable, I've seen about 5,000. So I know it's, it's, uh, it's accurate. It's never been disavowed. So what, where did that leave us? Well, that left us on the 1st of February, 2008, uh, with a very clear warning. Um, Burns titled his cable, Nyet means Nyet, Russia's NATO enlargement red lines, end quote. Now, what happened two months later on March, you know, February, March? Okay, on the 3rd of April, that was the Bucharest declaration that Jim referred to, uh, in which NATO said in a very, in their declaration that uh, Ukraine and Georgia will become part of NATO. So now we can kind of fast forward now to what's gone on for the last year or so, but that's the background, okay? And so for, for people to say the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and mind you, I don't like invasions of other countries, but I try to understand what lies behind them, okay? People who say that it was unprovoked are lying through their teeth, it was provoked for, to a fairly well. And late last year, when Putin tried to deal with NATO and, and get NATO to take them seriously, he ran into a brick wall. And last but not least, he developed this very close relationship with President Xi Jinping in China. And, and knowing that Xi Jinping would back him up, that, in my view, was a large factor in emboldening Putin to go ahead and did what he did, to do what he did, to try to denazify, to demilitarize, and to prevent Ukraine from putting offensive strike missiles in that part of Europe. So that's some of the background here.
be happy to talk about any of the specific subjects that you would like me to, Jim. Thank you, Ray. Um, let's uh, let's talk a, a, a moment about uh, why do you think, given the Cold War originating as it did in a uh, communist capitalist rivalry, what do you think is really going on in the US psyche or the US diplomatic or intelligence communities such that even though the, the Soviet Union no longer exists, even though there's no more communism in Russia or uh, uh, even in China for that matter, um, why, why would um, the United States so relentlessly push NATO to the East and yet and continue to vilify Russia when none of the reasons that were originally given any longer exist? How, how do you understand that? Because that seems to me to be a very puzzling phenomenon if you look at it objectively. That's a very good question, Jim. Uh, the answer is twofold. Filthy lucre. Um, I use an acronym. Eisenhower talked about the military industrial complex. I think it's evolved in such a way that now it should be called a Mickey Mat. Now, those of you who remember Mickey Mouse, okay, it sort of rhymes with Mickey Mouse. That's how you remember it. It stands for the Military Industrial Congressional Intelligence Media Academia Think Tank Complex. Why do I say media? Because without media, it doesn't work. It's the linchpin who controls yes. the media, the rest of the military. Industry. Now, you have to have an enemy to make this work. That's the simple, that's the simple uh, answer to this. And the people who are in control of the United States are embedded in this Mickey Mat, this military industrial congressional intelligence media academia think tank complex. It's all embracing and they need a they need an enemy to make money. That's number one. Number two is as Putin himself has said many times, uh, US foreign policy and military policy is hostage, Putin's word, hostage to US domestic politics. What does he mean by that? Well, here's an example. Bill Clinton, you mentioned, decided, ha, huh, that promise about not moving NATO one inch to the east, uh, is that written down somewhere? Where, 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 show me that. <laughs> okay, well, he's a lawyer, right? So he said, yeah, it wasn't written down. Uh, we'll just disregard it and we'll expand NATO to the east. Now, this is not one or two countries, as you already mentioned, Jim, 14 more countries, all of them to the east of East Germany. Now, that would double the size of NATO. So what do we have here? We have a situation that uh, Putin is watching. He watched when Yeltsin, as you mentioned, and he appealed to the West, let, let us join in this European security con uh, confederation. We should be part of Europe, you know, into Western Europe. That's what Peter the Great and for three centuries they tried to do. And the West said, no, no, we need an enemy. You're it. And by the way, when we get finished with you, China is our next number one enemy. So what you have here, and you know, I speak from some knowledge on this, Jack Matlock, the last ambassador or next to the last ambassador to the Soviet Union, is a friend of mine. We worked together in the in the 70s, uh, doing the START Treaty and stuff like that. Anyhow, Jack told me that when he testified before Congress and said, this is a really bad idea to expand NATO. I was there when the promises were made. I know what the, the Russians were given to understand. And why? Russia's no threat. It's on its back. Why do you want to improve? What do you want to expand NATO? And one of the staffers says after Jack, Matlock testifies. He's a Jack, Ambassador Matlock. Look, this is a this is a political thing. 
Uh, Clemson thinks he might lose against the uh, against Door, and he needs a lot of votes in the in the heavily populated by East European emigres Midwest, and so it's going to happen. There's nothing you can do to argue against it. It's going to happen. So that's the second thing: hostage U.S. foreign policy, hostage to um, internal domestic things. Now, the the problem here, of course, is right now. <laughs> The Democrats are in a really tough position come with the uh, midterms coming. And so is Biden and the Democrats, are, are they hostage on this subject? Are they willing to threaten to use nuclear weapons or are they, th- are they willing to give Putin the kind of defeat, if they can, that would make him resort to nuclear weapons? That's where it gets really sticky, because that's about where we are now. Russia can't afford to lose in Ukraine, and Biden can't afford to lose in the United States. He's got to appear very strong, stronger than the Republicans, even with the with the upcoming midterm elections. Well, let's dwell on this uh, nuclear issue for a moment, uh, Ray, uh, within the context of the Cuban Missile Crisis and. Uh, I think it's important to juxtapose what happened back in 1962 with what's happening now um, in uh, 2022, um, uh, 60 years later, because there's, there's, there's very striking parallels. You have a situation, uh, just to summarize it, and then you can comment, where um, the United States since 1823 and the Monroe Doctrine is declared that the entire Western Hemisphere is off limits to any European or foreign power of any kind uh, to come into the, any part of the Western Hemisphere from Canada down to uh, Chile and Argentina at the southern tip of, of South America and set up a military alliance or military forces. Right. And that has been maintained as the American buffer It's got two oceans on the east and the west and the Monroe Doctrine that protects the United States uh, from any attack. In 1962, Fidel Castro, who was the uh, leader of uh, Cuba, invited the the Soviets under Nikita Khrushchev to deploy nuclear weapons in Cuba because uh, he had been invaded. The United States was trying to overthrow him and he was trying to create a counter force that would keep the US uh, at bay. Uh, Nikita Khrushchev agreed, Uh, the weapons were on their way and the US upon discovering it, threatened to go to nuclear war unless the Soviets turned around. A deal was brokered whereby Kennedy and Khrushchev worked out that the Soviets would not deploy their missiles in in Cuba in exchange for the U.S. weapons that already existed in Turkey would be withdrawn. The crisis was averted. It lasted about 13 days, I believe it was. There's a very uh, well-known movie called 13 Days in October that recounts how close the U.S. came to going to first strike nuclear against the Soviet Union. It was recommended by uh, the Pentagon. It was recommended by the Secretary of Defense. And it was really uh, Bobby Kennedy, uh, John Kennedy's brother that said, wait a minute here, you cannot go to nuclear war. That cannot be your legacy. Um, So we, 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 we extricated ourselves from that. And here you have another great power needing a buffer zone for all the reasons that you des- described, having been invaded countless times uh, uh, over its, uh, its history from Western Europe. Not once has the Soviet Union or Russia invaded to the, uh, to the West, except for when they were chasing the Nazi armies out of Russia uh, back to Berlin. And then they decided, and that was an agreement that was made in Yalta in 1945 by Roosevelt and Churchill and Stalin um, that that Russia needed, the Soviet Union needed a buffer zone um, because of the German uh, invasion. 
And that was an agreement that closed out the war. Now you have this, the, the uh, United States moving to the East in a relentless way, depriving uh, Russia of any kind of buffer, now moving into Ukraine. And if anybody wants to look at a map, if you look at the map of Ukraine, it juts into the heartland of Russia. That's why Lavrov and Putin said, this is the red line. We're not going to mm-hmm. allow this to happen. So speak to us, since you were no doubt around during the Cuban Missile Crisis and probably involved in these things, if there's anything I've said that isn't accurate or anything that you want to embellish. But the, the conversation here is how great powers need buffer zones. Uh, and how an encroachment on those buffer zones is considered to be an existential threat. We insisted on it in our case, but we're denying the Russians, in this case of Ukraine, the same right we would go to nuclear war to protect and almost did so in 1962. So speak to us about this complex relationship between big powers and buffer zones and the Cuban Missile sure. Crisis, and the incursion into Ukraine. Sure, Jim. Um, now, there are big powers, and there are exceptional powers. Uh, Russia is not an exceptional power. We are. Russia is not, uh, I'm being a little bit uh, sarcastic here. Russia is not entitled to any buffer, Joan. We are. That's the attitude. Now, I would just say that Putin called Obama on this specifically in an op-ed that he wrote on September 11, 2013. September 11, just a coincidence. What he said was, I'm really glad that we have increasing trust now that we've worked after the steel to get Syrian biological weapons or chemical weapons destroyed. But I do object to what you say, Mr. Obama, about the U.S. being exceptional. Uh, You always say it in all your speeches. In my view, there are countries at different stages of democracy, countries that are developing. But when God looks down at all the world, he sees all countries as being equal. Now, I was reliably informed at the time that Putin penned that last paragraph to that op-ed himself, okay? Confirmation came uh, about two years later when he was being interviewed and sort of off the top of his head, he repeated that paragraph virtually verbatim. So, you know, I mean, it sounds strange because it is really strange, but the U.S. has considered itself not only city on the hill, uh, but a uh, an exceptional, or as Madeleine Albright would have it, the indispensable nation. So if we're the indispensable nature, what are all other nations? Well, what's the antonym to indispensable? You've got it, dispensable. And that's been the attitude. So going back to the Cuban Missile Crisis, I was alive during World War II. I was also alive (laughs) during this crisis. I had been commissioned in the U.S. Army as a combat intelligence officer. I was at Fort Benning on the 3rd of November when I reported for active duty, 1962. Always so odd Mm -hmm. about that. There were no weapons there. Some of us hotshots were really interested in, in firing these new grenade launchers. Biggest, you know, biggest new improvement, grenade launchers and so forth. There weren't any. We asked one of the NCOs, where are all the weapons? This is the Army Infantry School. Where are the weapons? They said, oh, they were all down in Key West. Key West, as you know, is right opposite Cuba. They were ready to go. That's how close we came. Now, you talked about an existential threat. John Kennedy was brave enough to recognize this as an existential threat. And we intelligence people, although we didn't predict what Khrushchev was about to do, we found the missiles. And we told the president, 
the Russians are putting actually have already in place some missiles in Cuba. Now we assess, said we in the CIA, we assess that there are no nuclear uh, warheads on these missiles. So, uh, you know, we get time to, to, to face them down. Guess what? There were nuclear warheads on some of those missiles. They were ready to fire. We didn't know that until 30 years later. Okay. So that's how we assess or we think, or that's how good those judgments are. That's kind of an aside, but that's what we told Kennedy. Now, Kennedy, to his great credit, insisted that besides these crazies of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and he called them crazies, Curtis LeMay, they wanted a nuke R Russia over this. Like, they really wanted to. And they said, you're a coward, Mr. President. And they said that to his face. Kennedy left the meeting and he said, yeah, these people are really crazy. So he had Llewellyn Thompson, who, was, who had just left his post as an ambassador to the Soviet Union and who was you know, just as good a uh, Soviet analyst as George Kennan before him. And he had Llewellyn Thompson participate in every single one of those meetings <laughs> that planned about the, what the U.S. would do in terms of reacting. And when Khrushchev came through with two messages, one a conciliatory message and the other a real hard line message, Llewellyn Thompson spoke up and he said, Mr. President, I suggest that you just answer the conciliatory message, because this hardline message was no doubt composed with a bunch of these military generals looking over his shoulder. <laughs> okay. And that's exactly what happened. That eased the confrontation. Bobby Kennedy, of course, played a crucial role. And we got out of that because Kennedy saw he needed a quo to give the Russians. And as you already mentioned, there were offensive missiles in Turkey. Kennedy agreed to remove those. So what's the analogy here? The analogy is perfect. The analogy is apt. It's not an analogy with the US invasion of Iraq or in the invasion of Afghanistan. We lost and we came home, big deal. It was not an existential threat. It was a war of choice, new nomenclature. So what about how Putin looks at this threat from NATO. Well, he looks at it and he said so as an existential threat. And I'm just taking that one or two steps farther. Uh, for, for what it's worth, in my view, the Russian army is going to prevail in southeast Ukraine. They're going to be able to envelop all the battalions that the Ukrainians have left. And, and get control of the Donbass. Uh, they may also succeed in getting uh, a land bridge to Crimea. They already have one. Will they be able to defend it? That's another question. So that's the situation on the ground. But let's say that the US is right. If we send 40 billion, a B, like billion with a B, right? In addition to the 14 billion we're already sent in arms, what do we do? We pay Lockheed, we pay Raytheon, <laughs> hello. So if we, we do that and we back, let's say we back Putin up against the wall. Now he's already warned, hey, by the way, don't forget we have nuclear weapons. Would he be likely to use them? Well, Soviet doctrine says, yes, if there's a threat to the, ex to the existence of, Soviet Union, of Russia, Yes, that's one condition under which we would threaten or maybe even use nuclear weapons. So what I'm saying is this, uh, even the intelligence gurus, the muckety mucks, as my Irish grandmother would call them, even they have testified as recently as a week ago that Putin could regard this as an existential threat if we put his back against the wall. So that's the syllogism. Existential threat, if we put his back against the wall, what should U.S. policy do? Now, intelligence officers are not supposed to prescribe U.S. policy, but our current policy is, yeah, put his, put his back against the wall. Uh, send $54 billion, make sure that he's going to lose. Now, uh, I'll just finish by saying, Putin cannot afford to lose. Does he have the wherewithal to, provi to prevail? He does in that part of the world. Is he going to do that? I think he will. But 
and the unlikely chance, but you know, we're talking about nuclear war. We're talking about being fried alive, all of us, uh, on the unlikely chance and the on the chance that he's uh, driven uh, driven to the wall. Uh, he has nuclear weapons, and when he says, you know, remember we have nuclear weapons, that's new, as you know, Jim. Not even Soviet you, uh, leaders used to say that. I mean, it was tacitly understood that, you know, this was a line you should, of course, because they're there. But to have Russian leaders, Putin, Lavrov, and others saying, you know, uh, we're closer to nuclear war than we have been before. Well, we are. And the analogy is the Cuban Missile Crisis, because that was an existential threat or seen as so by Kennedy. Ukraine is seen as an existential threat to, to Putin. And that's why we have this kind of uh, conflict going on in Ukraine. Last thing I'll say here is that I was surprised, as you may know, I forget last time we were together, I thought that Putin could achieve his objectives without actually invading Ukraine. There seemed to be some flexibility on the US side. I was wrong. What did I base that on? Well, go back to December. On December 7th, Biden and Putin talked on the phone and they set up this negotiation track, which would start in Geneva on the 12th of January of this year. Then all of a sudden, on the 30th of December, Putin makes it known, I got to talk to you, Joe Biden. I got to talk to you right away. Well, what was that all about? Biden sensibly said, all right, let's talk. They talked by telephone. What was the U.S. readout of the talk? Nothing. What was the Russian readout? The Russian readout, and I'll say it in quotation marks. President Biden said the United States has no intention of putting offensive strike missiles in Ukraine, period, end quote. Now, nobody questioned the Russian readout of that conversation, but that commitment, that promise was made, according to the Russians, and as I say, not in dispute. Uh, you don't know that. Nobody knows that because it wasn't in the U.S. press. But what happened to that? What happened, you know? Well, Putin's looking on and the negotiations start. Oh, they forgot about that. You know, they went to Biden the next day and said, Joe, <laughs> come on. Yeah, these are aces in the hole, putting offensive missiles in Ukraine, just like we have them in, in Romania already, just like we or could have. And we have emplacements there which can be easily stocked with uh, what Putin calls Tomagok <laughs> missiles, Tomahawk missiles, and, or, or, and in Poland. So you don't give that away, Joe. And Apparently, just oh, okay. Uh, so what I'm saying here is that Putin is looking at this and says the same old stuff. The president really can't make good on his promises. Who is he answer to? The Mickey Matt, the people who are going to ensure that his party might do better in the midterms than otherwise indicated. And uh, and so you've got Putin looking on this and saying to President Xi of China when they met on the 4th of February of this year, the Olympics were starting and it was a ceremonial thing, but the US and China, US, China and Russia issued a very solemn declaration saying not only as they had said before, that their alliance transcends or exceeds a normal alliance, but they said there's no upper limit to our alliance. Okay, that was the 4th of February. Now, that's fact. I'm going to add my own little speculation. Here's what Putin said to Z. Uh, President Z, I know we're best friends and all. I just want to know that I want you to know that the, the U.S. is still not taking us seriously. Uh, we have information that the Ukrainians are going to attack Donetsk and Luhansk, all must. Uh, we want to clean out those Nazis and demilitarize. Ukraine. I may have to. I, I may have to invade Ukraine. Z, President Z of China. You mean after the Olympics, right? Oh yeah, of course, after the Olympics. One day after the Olympics, Putin recognizes uh, Lugansk and Donetsk. Two days, three days later is the invasion. Now, why is that important? My God, 
you've got Russia and China together in a way that even Henry Kissinger is pulling his hair out about. Henry Kissinger yesterday is, is warning about a possibility of nuclear war and is especially worried and especially upset by the fact that was he, he was able to play Russia and China off against each other. Uh, these successive administrations have driven them together. This is the new tectonic shift in relations in, in what the Soviets used to call, you remember that, Jim, the world correlation of forces. You know, if you've got the white West arrayed against, well, we're black in Russia enough to make them people of color, haven't we? China, India, Brazil, mm-hmm. South Africa. Well, you know, to claim that Russia is isolated is, uh, is whistling in the dark. And I hope that our guys get, get smart enough to realize that they can push Russia just so far. Mm. Yeah, very, very good point, Ray. Uh, you know, you would have thought that any strategists in the U.S. Uh, camp, as it were, in the Pentagon would see that U.S., Europe, Russia as a single integrated economic military zone would basically dominate the world, certainly against China. And because of what we've done in moving NATO to the east and vilifying the Russians, we've forced the Russians and the Chinese into a partnership they may not have naturally come to. Because I think you're right about Peter the Great and his influence on Russia. Russia has always looked to the West. And it's the fact that the West won't accept the Russians as equals um, in some fundamental existential way that uh, inhibits the the natural alliance that I think the Russian people in government would have very naturally wanted to embrace so that you, you now have the U.S. and Europe now getting isolated uh, from the rest of the world. Uh, and as it turns out, it's the kind of the Caucasians and the, uh, the, the people of color. It's a very mm-hmm. interesting way to, uh, to look at what's going on uh, because I think there's a lot of truth. And so that the reverberations of what you're saying in this fundamental shift of the tectonic plates, uh, among other things, I've been reading a lot about how Russia, China, uh, the Saudis are now putting huge pressure on the U.S. dollar. There's more pressure on the dollar as the world's currency now than there's ever been before, in part because the Russians are saying that if you want our oil, you want our gas, you pay for it in rubles. And the ruble now is stronger against other world currencies uh, <laughs> today than it was before the invasion. Uh, and so there's a many things that are reverberating around the world because of, of uh, uh, this NATO uh, push to the east that I don't think uh, were originally or initially calculated for by the, by the U.S. You know, uh, Jim, you're right. And I think we also have to weave in how much popular support Vladimir Putin enjoys. Um, most Russian folks have either a grandfather or even a father, someone who is among those 26 million or 27, some people say, 27 million who perished in World War II. That's big. They remember that. That came at the hands of the Nazis. Now, are they Nazis in Ukraine? They're sure as hell are. I mean, they, f- they fly flags with swastikas on them, for God's sake. There are a whole bunch of them down underneath the Mariupol uh, factory, and they're going to be flushed out today or tomorrow. So when Putin is appealing to his own people and saying, look, these Nazis have killed 14,000 of your compatriots, many of them Russian citizens in Donetsk, and Lugansk. We're going to clean them out. Well, his approval rating is over 80%. Um, Biden's not so much. (laughs) Biden's just going down. So to think that the uh, Russian people would not support Putin in doing what he feels is needed to be done in in Ukraine is to do some wishful thinking. Um, They know their history. 
They know what's at stake. And they know when Putin says this is an existential threat, they know what that means because they had to face those things as recently as 77 years ago when World War II finally came to an end. Mm. Let's uh, let's turn to Ukraine, uh, Ray, because we've talked a lot about the United States and Russia and the blocks of power and the geostrategic uh, uh, chessboard, as it were. But all this is happening in Ukraine. And uh, I think it's worth just noting um, that Ukraine, its largest country in Europe, it's one of the largest breadbaskets in the world. Uh, has a very complicated uh, history, of course, as you've pointed out. Where, in your view, does the 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 uh, uh, the will of the Ukrainian people uh, uh, play out? Because um, obviously, Russia needs a buffer zone, but Ukraine needs its sovereignty. Um, mm -hmm. uh, how how do you understand what's going on in Ukraine, and what rights do the Ukrainians have? Uh, in this picture? <laughs> well, I think, Jim, one has to go back to 2014 when we had what was appropriately called the most blatant coup d'etat in history. Why? Well, it was advertised 18 days before the coup on YouTube. Our Assistant Secretary of State, Victoria Nuland, talking with our ambassador in Kiev saying, Yats is the guy, he's the guy, he's, we're going to make him prime minister. And uh, by the way, um, we'll let the Nazis uh, take a second position there. Uh, Tani Hook, uh, he's to he's to write us, well, we'll let them be in the answer room. And, uh, and to get this thing to stick, um, we've just heard, or I've just heard, says Victoria Nolan, uh, from Jake Sullivan. Uh, Jake Sullivan, you know, uh, Jake Sullivan works for Joe Biden, Vice President Biden. And Sullivan says uh, uh, the president will come in here and make this stick. We need an international personage. And Joe Biden is willing to come in here and glue this thing together in an international way. That's in the intercepted conversation. Was it authentic? Well, we know it was authentic because Victoria Newland, when she was praised by the ambassador, well, what will the EU think of it? She says, F the EU. Okay. And two days later, she said, oh, she apologized to the EU, not for the coup, but for saying, you know, F the EU. So this was advertised ahead. They went ahead anyway. Where was Putin? He was in Sochi at the Winter Olympics. Okay. He came home and he had a council of war and said, what are we going to do? These guys are going to join NATO. They had already said they would. <clears throat> Does that mean that our only all year round ice free naval base in Sevastopol in Crimea, that that would be under NATO? Give me a break. So now John McCain made, made it very clear that uh, what, what Putin did in annexing after a plebiscite Crimea was unprovoked. That was unprovoked. <laughs> Well, I wrote a letter to the Washington Post saying, you know, that was not unprovoked. You never mentioned the history of this coup. And guess what? The muckety mucks must have been out in the Hamptons sipping martinis because the, the substitute published that letter. It said unprovoked, forget about it. It was provoked. Now, that was Crimea. Do I like people annexing parts of other countries? No. Do I understand why Putin did it? If I were Putin, you know, this, this relates to hypocrisy, okay? If I were the head of, of Russia, I would have done precisely the same thing, precisely. Now, would I have invaded Ukraine? I like to think I wouldn't have, but I can understand why it's really a blatant lie to say that it was unprovoked. Mm -hmm. So, Ray, um... As we bring this uh, conversation to a close, I thank you so much for your deep insights and clarity. As things stand now, you've got Russia consolidating in the Donbass in the corridor between uh, Crimea and the Donbass. On the other hand, you've got billions of arms being 
put in to Ukraine to bolster their forces. You've got Sweden and Finland saying that the uh, situation is so uh, urgent that they want to join NATO. Uh, you have the Russians um, uh, defiantly uh, refusing to back down. So you have all the recipes uh, in various sectors here for a higher conflagration uh, with a possible nuclear exchange uh, as a result. How would you, given the complexities, how would you find a way home? How would you, what, if you had to, to, to give counsel to Biden, uh, who's really the only player, uh, the US is really the only player here, uh, what, what, what can be done to uh, uh, break this impasse and bring about a new equilibrium like Kennedy and Khrushchev were able to do uh, in 1962, what would be the equivalent move here mm -hmm. in Ukraine that would solve this crisis like the exchange of missile reductions back in 1962? How, how do you see it potentially playing out? Yeah. Well, in 62, we had, you may recall, Jim, uh, a kind of a breathing space. Um, uh, Kennedy made, made clear that he wasn't going to do anything right away. Uh, he took uh, a couple of weeks to decide. Uh, right now, we need some breathing space in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. What I'm suggesting is that Zelensky has to be reined in. We can't give him the idea that he can keep, uh, keep on facing into Russia's military. We have to say, look, uh, Zelensky, we need an immediate ceasefire. We need to work this thing out. Because Mr. Zelensky, although we haven't told you this before, we recognize that Russia is also entitled to its own buffer zone. And that's you. And you know, Zelensky, that eight years ago, an agreement seven years ago, an agreement was worked out where the Russian speaking provinces could have regional autonomy, and you reneged on that. And we know that you did that because we told you to. <laughs> but we're, we're a little concerned now, this getting out of hand. So let's talk. You're going to have to accept that Donbass going completely independent or maybe being annexed by, by Russia. But do you still want to kill uh, thousands of people every week? Ukrainians? Uh, do you want us to fight this war to the last Ukrainian? Um, we got to talk, okay? Now, that would be a sensible thing to do, but it would have to recognize that Russia has its own interests here, strategic interests, its own, uh, its own buffer zone in mind. What's the situation on the ground? Well, as you say, Jim, it couldn't be more complicated. What, what I fear in the next couple of weeks is that the Russian advance, slow as it is, uh, westward from the Donbass, is going to succeed in ways that nobody anticipates. We have been subjected to propaganda. The West is winning. The Russians are taking it on the chin. That's not going to happen. The Russians are not going to take it on the chin militarily. Now, what about all these uh, $54 billion worth of uh, thing, money that we're giving to Raytheon and Lockheed? Well, uh, Scott Ritter, a good friend of mine, and to, to whom I defer on some of these military judgments, uh, we discussed about three weeks ago that you know Russia has it in its capacity to bomb those weapons as soon as they arrive in Ukraine. That it will be, you know, the only people that would profit from this are the people that replace the weapons that have already been bombed, put more in there. Well, we'll get, we'll get 54 billion right quick, okay? But that's apparently not been the case. In other words, Although we expected the Russians to be able to interdict the entrance of these weapons, like these 155 millimeter howitzers. I mean, they're old, but they're very improved. We used to train on them at Fort Benning when the howitzers came back from Key West. Okay, so they're appearing on the battlefield. Uh, I, I asked Scott, how do you account for that? Well, we don't know. We don't know how they're getting there, but they're getting there, okay? And they are doing real damage to Russian forces. So this is pretty complicated from both points of view. Can the West continue to pour this stuff in? Will the Russians be able to 
force them back and carve out what they think they need for a buffer zone? Or will it escalate? Will it escalate partly because for Biden and the Democrats, it is or can be seen as an existential threat. They can't afford to, to lose any more than Putin can afford to lose. That makes for a very combustible environment. Yeah, yeah, the domestic politics are now in play with regards to November in a very closely contested election. Uh, Putin has got his back to the wall. Uh, there's many interests now that uh, see advantage in further escalation. That's the, that's the real uh, danger here, I think. Yeah, Jim, you know, you know the Russians. Uh, I, I've served in Russia as well. Uh, Americans have very few links or contacts with Russians. Mm. They don't know Russian history. And you mentioned Yeltsin before, and, and I want to mention this because it's almost never mentioned. When the Soviet Union fell apart, uh, we interfered in the 1996 election and got Yeltsin reelected. It's very clear. It was on the cover of Time magazine how we interfered and got them. These were the Harvard boys that were exploiting together with the oligarchs, exploiting, expropriating, uh, taking all the Russian wealth out of the country. And to put this in a personal and a personal sort of thing, I want to just refer to something from the World Bank as to what happened in the early 90s. You were around in the early 90s. You were in Russia part of that time. But most Americans, uh, this will be news to them. Are you ready? World Bank reported that, quote, life expectancy for men plummeted from 63% Russians in 1991 to 57%, not percent, uh, 63 um, years old to 57 years old in 1994. So that's five years, five years. You died earlier at 63. You died after this expropriation and all this interference by the Harvard guys. You died at 57 in 1994. That's extraordinary. Uh, th those are World Bank figures, okay? So Russians remember that. That wasn't all that long ago. And instead of being friends with us, they remember things like that, Harvard boys interference, the muckety mucks, and this, uh, this notion that Russians really should not be taken seriously because there's some, something like, a, you know, something like a, a gas station posing as a country. That's Obama said that, you know? So here's my, here's my vision here. You, you got Tchaikovsky, you got Pushkin, Dostoevsky, you know, pumping gas because they give me a break. I mean, you don't have to know a lot about Russians to realize that they're an extremely talented country. They should be taken seriously. And if they're not, there's going to be more trouble ahead. Yeah. Well, thank you, Ray. Uh, just one comment. Uh, there's been a few people in the chat saying that the Russians have invaded uh, uh, countries. Uh, and of course, that's true. Uh, they invaded Eastern Afghanistan. Europe. Uh, you know, they came into various parts of Eastern Europe. I was uh, meaning that, that there's been no equivalent to what Napoleon and Hitler did. Uh, yeah. Just a naked a invasion of Russia. The Russians have never come invaded Western Europe was the, the essential point that I'm making, which was the predicate of, uh, yeah. of uh, NATO in, in, in a very fundamental way. Well, so I just wanted to make sure people understood yeah. that. Jim, I was gonna interrupt at that point too, but then you mentioned Yalta. I mean, spheres of influence, buffer zones, yeah. if you will. Yeah. Uh, even in the heat of war, people realized that people needed some measure of security. And that's why, you know, that's why Eastern Europe went that way, Afghanistan, other things like that. Well, you know, for every Afghanistan, you have our Afghanistan, you have our Iraq and you have our Libya and you have other things. So, you know, it's a matter of uh, not uh, what about ism, but a matter of uh, being fair and looking at how the Russians look at the United States and trust has evaporated 
that makes it very dangerous. Extremely, extremely dangerous. And as someone, uh, Ray, like you, that you know went through the Cold War and went through all the efforts that many of us made to bring peace and, and reconciliation uh, during the Gorbachev period, I, I think the, the situation is more dangerous now. There's more vilification uh, of Russia and the Russian leadership now uh, than even during the Soviet period. Back then, mm -hmm. there was at least a reciprocal respect mm -hmm. um, that has evaporated. It's, it's, a, it's mm -hmm. kind of a, uh, a, an arrogant disregard uh, for yep. any humanity or civility on the other side. And that's a yep. very dangerous psychological place to be because it justifies almost anything. It's even more complicated, Jim, if I could just add this note. Sure. Uh, starting uh, when Trump was running for president, an artificial campaign was concocted by the Democrats to say that Russia was interfering in the election of 2016. Most Americans still believe that. Why? Because... For example, it has been proven that there was no Russian hacking of the DNC emails. Nobody hacked those emails. They were put on a thumb drive and taken to WikiLeaks where they were published. That and other things like even before the election, what about Trump's ties with Alpha Bank in Moscow? Well, uh, one of the smart lawyers working for the Clinton campaign, what's his name, Michael Sussman, is on trial today as we speak, because the emails that have been uncovered show that the thing was made out of whole cloth. It did influence the election, but not enough to help Hillary win. So there was rank, uh, rank hypocrisy, rank uh, deceit on the part of of the of the uh, Democrats, and to say that. Trump might have been right about this one little thing. Well, that was it. We had Trump derangement syndrome. <laughs> you couldn't possibly believe that Trump would say the truth about anything. He was, as he claims, they tried to make him not able to be elected. And then they tried to, to, re, to make him emasculated, which they succeeded in doing, particularly with respect to Russia. So what I'm saying is you heard five years of that. Okay? Five years, Russia, Russia. Russia, in our media, all over our mainstream media, that prepares the way mm. for Americans to believe now that Russia can do anything. They're invading without cause. They're unprovoked and all this kind of stuff. So that's a really important thing. That's why I'm delighted that you and others are, uh, are, are giving me and the others the opportunity to try to set the record straight. And uh, many of our viewers may, may uh, think about some of the things said here, and it will jar at first, but uh, look at the record and look at the court documents that show that this Russia gate was fully contrived without an ounce of, uh, of substance, sustenance be behind it. Well, Ray, thank you so much. And I know everyone that this has been controversial. Uh, it's always hard uh, to speak about these things when we know that the mainstream media and the governmental uh, organs of power are, are uh, moving so relentlessly toward one interpretation of current events. But part of what we do here at Humanity Rising uh, is to raise contrarian uh, points of view uh, because that's the democratic process to allow people like Ray with his deep insight to come on board and to challenge uh, the prevailing um, uh, narrative and speak uh, truth uh, to power uh, in a very uh, uh, compelling way. Jim, could I add one thing here? Of course. Uh, and that is uh, people will be looking for evidence. Now, what I just said about Russiagate is true, but it'd be a natural thing to, for Americans to say, well, how do you know that? <laughs> Well, how come I don't know that? Here's a really good example. Jim Comey, head of FBI, decided not to let his specialists look at the Democratic National Committee emails, but to hire uh, 
firm called CrowdStrike, headed by a guy who worked for the FBI for, for years and years, and they were going to look into the forensics. Long story short, they did. And it was spread about that, oh, yeah, the Russians hacked in and gave those emails to WikiLeaks. Guess what? That was a lie. Guess how I know that? The head of strike, CrowdStrike had to testify before the House Intelligence Committee. When did he do that? On the 5th of December, 2017. Okay, big deal. 2007. What did he say? He said, our technical capabilities were such that we can say there is no technical evidence that anyone hacked into the Dash, Nash, Democratic National Committee emails that were divulged by WikiLeaks. No technical evidence, okay? Whoa, what happened? That was December, December 5th, 2017. Did the head of CrowdStrike tell Bob Mueller? Apparently, maybe he did, maybe he didn't. Uh, did he tell anyone else? No. What did Adam Schiff, the head of the committee, do? Boom. Kept it secret for two and a half years. Two and a half years. December 5th, two and a half years. On May 7th, 2020, um, the head of the National Intelligence said, look, uh, Adam Schiff, if you don't release that testimony, sworn testimony by the fellow's name is Sean Henry, uh, then I'm going to release it. And Schiff said, okay. So he released it. When did he release it? May 7th, 2020. What's today? May something 2022. Hmm. The New York Times has suppressed that information, even though it was court testimony made public two years ago for two more years. Two and a half for Schiff, two years for the New York Times. When are we ever going to be able to get the truth out of these sworn documents. Well, it's going to come out this week, this one little escapade about Alpha Bank in Moscow uh, being in touch with Trump folks. That was contrived, and we can prove it from their own emails. Slowly but surely, I'm hopeful, and I can't bet on it, but I'm hopeful that Americans will be able to kind of get beneath this mindset that Russia, 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 Russia interfered. Now, what could be worse than accusing Russia what could be worse than accusing anybody of giving us four years of Trump? For God's sake, I'm no fan of Trump. But if they didn't do it, they didn't do it. And the proof is in the pudding. I recommend your viewers look up the testimony of Sean Henry. Henry is last name, first name, S-H-A-W-N. Look it up. It should be available in the House Select Committee on intelligence documents, unless they've put it in the deep black hole. Thank you, Ray. That brings Most our welcome, session Jim. to a close, everyone. Uh, lots of uh, matters of great weight to consider here about yeah. how the image of Russia is being uh, uh, manipulated and uh, distorted uh, to justify an extraordinary increase in the militarization of our world right now. Uh, so these are, these are real issues and uh, they, they, they deserve deep thought and reflection. And that's why we've taken the time today uh, to bring Ray McGovern on, uh, who knows about these matters given his deep immersion in the Central Intelligence Agency and his close connections with, with people uh, in the larger uh, Washington uh, complex. So thank you, Ray. Uh, you're all welcome to join our after session uh, chat group, those of you who are interested. And we'll see you here again tomorrow on Humanity Rising, where we're going to completely change the subject to look at youth in crisis uh, in the United States and around the world. Uh, the world is being challenged in terms of public health as never before, given two years of COVID. And young people worldwide are almost literally under assault by reality and they're suffering. And we're gonna be talking about uh, both the suffering of youth and relationship to addiction in particular and how we can help them uh, through this struggle. Thank you, we'll see you tomorrow. Bye for now. Thank you, Ray.